نبرات شعري سطرت لمداد حبري والقلم نبرات شعري سطرت لمداد حبري والقلم نبرات شعري سطرت لمداد حبري والقلم حيا قصائد سائلي قلب النوى ليس الشبم حيا قصائد سائلي قلب النوى ليس الشبم Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wassalamu ala rasulullah, assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh, and I hope um, uh, everybody's okay. Welcome to um, uh, People of the Book, and welcome to our um, uh, uh, changed schedule, which was supposed to be on a Wednesday, but we've moved it now to a Saturday, which is the evolution of fiqh, and um, I hope you've all had a good Eid, and last week we didn't have the, the, the class because it was supposed, because it was Eid, so alhamdulillah we moved it till today. I'm still on holiday, today's my last day on uh, of a holiday and I start work again tomorrow so uh, uh, the game is a game over kind of thing like you know so I hope everybody's okay and um, I just got a message from uh, my co-host that she's on the way so inshallah the reading will be more easier um, right okay so uh, alhamdulillah yeah uh, my other announcement again is that like uh, um, um, I'm uh, broadcasting on O people of the book um, consider this TV and also the uh, also my twitter my twitter handle which is uh, uh which is uh, um do underscore jam and also other announcement please subscribe like and share yeah and hit that button so hard to hit that um, bell so hard that even the neighbors can hear it okay so now what else do i have here also i have to tell you about my book as well i keep saying that every time please support the dawa please support the the, the patreon you will see um on the you will see on the um, under the the the, the what, what do you call it the the, the video and the, there is a link there and that uh, takes you to my um, uh, Patreon. You will see the first chapter of my book there and um, uh, gradually, inshallah, with your dua. I don't know what happens to me now. Every time I I I, I, I want to do my book, I lose motivation, and that's the way it is. Sometimes when you're writing, you have to get that motivation and everything. Some people get it very more often, but I don't. And suddenly, I could just get up and just you know, spend two days, three days uh, without doing anything and just carry on with the book. But now, every time I open the the, the laptop, or I open the computer, or whatever, other things um, uh, distract me, kind of thing. So please make that for me that Allah makes it easy that I can finish the the book okay what else do we have um yeah last last time last session we'd gone through the zaidi madhab and we'd gone through the um, the zaidi madhab and how like you know uh, uh it came from yemen and everything and i think i did mention that the zaidi madhab of, of the time is not the same as the the zaidi madhab now what they've done is now they've actually uh pledged allegiance to the actual 12 uh, shias who have made them now follow the, the because because of the help because of the help they need Needed for their fight against them, the, the countries around them and everything. So what has happened is that they've taken them uh, allegiance with the with the Iranian um, uh, government. So it ends up that they've taken the the, the more more deep in depth uh, Shia madhab kind of thing. So we could say that if they have gone that far then we could say that it has taken them out of the fold of islam unless because before they refused to uh to curse the 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 the, the sahaba they refused a lot of things that the 12 is um, uh, you know what we're doing and this is why they were considered among the sunni madhabs but now depending on their stance now whether they've just done that just to get aid uh, to get aid from the from from iran or whether they have really pledged allegiance to them and follow what they follow then you know obviously they they they, they have been driven um, out of islam by by this um uh, um, school of thought. Anyway, now we move to the Laithi Madhab. The Laithi Madhab, which was um, uh, the founder, is Imam Al Laith. Imam Al Laith, who was born in in seven uh, seven sixteen and died at uh, se uh, died in seven ninety one. Sorry, died in seven ninety one of uh, the Common Era. This Madhab was named after Al Laith bin Saad, who was born in Egypt of Persian par parentage. Just give me one second, please. Give me one second, like just um, probably. Yeah, so 
let's uh okay this is um, uh, my co-host sister halima assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh sister um oh what's happened assalamu alaikum sister can you hear me right assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh how are you sister uh, i think you're muted you're muted i can't hear you no okay she's gone out and she's going to come back in just give me one second i think i need to put my headphones on just one second please Okay, that's much better now. Anyway, yes, yeah, sister, um, if you can hear me, it's, it's saying that your devices are not connected. So I think it's better if you go out and you come back in again. And um, yeah, so what, as, as we were saying, as we were saying, the, this madhab was named after Alayth bin Saad, who was born in Egypt of, per, of Persian parentage. Now, remember, there's some of these um, um, madhabs here that you may never have heard of, yeah? You may heard of people quoting them. You have scholars who, who will be quote, quoting them in their books and in their um, uh, uh, lectures or whatever. But you might not see much works from them. Yeah, and this is a reason why, like you know, obviously we have to go through them. Then you will understand. Some of them were even as more more powerful as as the actual um, as the actual madhabs that we have today. But unfortunately, they didn't survive. So he, he was born in, in Egypt of Persian parentage in the year seventeen sixteen. After an intensive study of all the known of all the known areas of the Islamic learning, Alayf became a major scholar of Egypt. You see, so he became a major scholar, but how come we don't hear of Alayf? Yeah, although he became a major scholar, he you know he should have um, uh, he should have um, uh, survived kind of thing. Yeah. He was a com contemporary of Imam Abu Hanifa and Imam Malik. So again, like, you know, being a contemporary of Imam Abu Hanifa and Imam Malik, how come we don't have, we don't hear from them? In fact, he carried on a debate with Imam Malik by mail on various points of Islamic law, one of which was, Ima was Mal uh, Malik's inclusion. Actually, I'm talking, I don't know if I'm, if, uh, if I'm being heard. Uh, Salaam alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum salam. Can you hear me uh, now? <laughs> yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you clearly now. Alhamdulillah. I How forgot to put on my new headset. <laughs> right. Alhamdulillah. Good. Alhamdulillah. I was one. I was. I was worried. I was wondering maybe I'm not going out. You know, I was. I was thinking. I, that's why I just um, uh, pressed on uh, the YouTube button to to see whether I was. Um, uh, I was. Uh, I was going out or not. Can you hear me clearly? Yeah. Oh yeah. You sound good. Okay. Good. Good. Alhamdulillah. So how, how have you been? Oh, I've been great, brother. Alhamdulillah. I have Good, been working a lot. <laughs> Good. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Oh. Allah's making things. Allah's opening doors for you. And oh. I understand you moved to a new location as well. May Allah open more doors for you and make things easy for you, inshallah. Alhamdulillah, inshallah. We yeah. uh, moved into the house and everything. Alhamdulillah. And, alhamdulillah. Yes, it's, we're settling in great. <laughs> Good, alhamdulillah. And this is um, uh, for the for the viewers to to understand. This is the reason why we shifted the timing because the system would not have been able to make it if it if it if it was on a Wednesday. Mm -hmm. Now we've shifted it to a Saturday, so she's uh, she's available on Saturday and Sunday. So otherwise, it would be a, a bit of a difficulty for me because you know to read and to explain. She's been making it very very easy for me recently. You know, so I could mm -hmm. gather my thoughts and and everything. So alhamdulillah. So yeah. So we were talking about. Um, uh, Imam Al-Layth, we've reached um, uh, Imam Al-Layth. You remember your last uh, session, we had fin finished on page 85. Uh, yes. We're starting page 86, and we spoke about the Zaydi Madhab, which were in Yemen. Then now we move on to the, the Laythi Madhab, and I have reached on to uh, the part, the, 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 the first paragraph, and um, the last, the last, uh, uh, the last sentence, which is one of which was Malik's inclusion of Med Medinite custom as an independent source of law. Now we know that Imam Malik, um, uh, he was he. Had 
that he was using as one of his sources the Medina custom. Yeah, the Urf, which is the, the Medina, the Medina customs, and uh, basically Imam uh, Leith was maybe uh, not happy with that, so he was like you know, um, having discussions with Imam Imam Malik. He was having discussions with Imam Malik through Mel on the various points. So, you know, obviously them being scholars, it doesn't mean that they were against one another, but maybe he was concerned, why are you using a, a Medina custom? Yeah, But because uh, Imam Malik was, was, was from that area kind of thing like you know so th that's the reason why anyway sister we we are now on reasons for for the madhab's disappearance like i mm -hmm. mentioned earlier on like i mentioned earlier on although he was such a powerful imam he was one of the major scholars <clears throat> of egypt why is it that his madhab disappeared yeah so we ask that question because this is this is how we're going through now we're seeing all these madhabs and we're seeing that some of them were powerful some of them were less powerful and we see that some of them disappeared so we're going through the reasons now if you want to read sister from the reasons for the madhab's disappearance okay reasons for the madhab's disappearance imam al-late's madhab disappeared shortly after his death in 791 ce for the following reasons a, he neither compiled, dictated, nor instructed his followers to record his legal opinions and their proofs according to his interpretations of the Quran, Sunnah, and legal positions of the Sahaba. Thus, very little remains of his, his madhab beyond a few references in the early books of comparative feek. Okay, right. So, so we see the reason now is because he himself he didn't compile a book. You wouldn't see a book on the shelf by Imam, Imam Leith. You know, um, you, you have Imam Malik. Some, uh, uh, um, what do you call it, uh, Muatta. You have uh, Imam uh, Imam uh, Ahmed bin Hanbal's books you have like you know but he didn't compile neither did he compile the books nor did he dictate nor did he tell his followers to 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 write his books down you find from the from the um, hanafi madhab that imam uh, abu yusuf he, he he was a student of uh, of imam abu hanifa and he wrote down a lot of his a lot, a lot of the stuff so that was the reason why they survived but he didn't now you see, not because he was any less uh, powerful, not because he was any less uh, good than what he, he should have been, but these are the reasons. Number two, sister, uh, B. Number two, B. The number of students under Al Laith was small, and since none of them became outstanding jurists, they were not in an influential position to popularize his madhab. Right. Okay. So he had very few students, although, again, he was one of the major scholars of Egypt, but he didn't have many students studying under him. And since none of them became jurists, I mean, you would have, for example, um, uh, like I just mentioned, Imam Abu Hanifa, his student, Imam Abu Yusuf, who became very well known, it would become very well known. And there were other students, others who studied under each of them, and they became well known, but his students didn't. So they didn't move any further, any, any f further, like, you know, to, to, to propagate his uh, his teachings and everything and this is uh, the other reason why his uh, te teaching disappeared also the, the also number c c is ash shaafi one of the most outstanding fiqh scholars settled in egypt immediately after al laith's death and his madhab quickly displaced of al laith Right. So this is one of the other reasons now. Although um, uh, it's not in competition, we can't say oh, oh, Imam, Imam Shafi was in competition with Al-Layth, but Al-Layth died. Al-Layth, um, uh, uh, Imam Al-Layth died and his, his, his writings were not compiled. So when Imam Shafi came, he was a, an outstanding thick scholar. So a lot of people forgot about what um, uh, uh, Imam Al-Layth had, 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 had been teaching and they adhered to the teachings of, of uh, uh, Imam Shafi. It is clear, you know, it is it's clear that like you know and again like I, I i need to remind them that it wasn't because he was uh, not a good scholar or whatever but there are different different reasons why you will see these um uh, scholars uh, you know some of them we don't have their teachings anymore some of them we do but like you know i'm um, only in reference where where, where imams like i mentioned earlier on uh uh, Sheikh Al, uh, Imam Al, Al, Al Zai, for example. Oh, another thing I need to mention. I don't know if I mentioned that in the last lesson. When we talk of these imams, we talk of these imams as only 
uh, teachers, scholars who, who taught the fiqh of the religion. We're not talking of the imams, the infallible imams that the Shias talk about, the line of the 12 imams that they believe in, that they think has more uh, or greater than the prophets or whatever. We cannot compare these. These were just teachers. Yeah. And sometimes they could have made mistakes. Sometimes they could have been, you know, right. Or they could have been studying uh, amongst one another. So let's not. Uh, uh, confuse the word imam here because we have had a uh, discussion with some people in Clubhouse uh, mm. where, where they've actually tried to compare, oh, you believe in the imams, you believe in Imam Bukhari, you believe in... No, Imam Bukhari had not, nothing to do with the imam the way they believe it. The imam, the way we, we believe them is these imams were actually scholars. They were scholars, they were teachers, and they were just giving knowledge, and that's all. There was nothing more than that. And even the, the, the imam said, if you find something that I've said, and you find the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ, which can't contradicts that, throw what I've said against the wall. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's clear. So, like you know, mm -hmm. I wanted to make that clear because uh, that conversation did come a few times with a few people um, who who were Shia, and they were talking uh, with, mm -hmm. and they tried to compare that Imam thing. They tried to play on that word Imam. So we need to know that the Imam that we are talking about here, they have nothing to do with them, uh, uh, the the rulers, uh, uh, the, the, the those who carried down the teachings of the Prophet No, the, that's why you will find that they were studying under one another. You will find that they were in different regions. They were traveling to study and everything so it's a totally different um, term imam yeah okay mm -hmm. sister carry on it is interesting to note that the that imam ashafi who had studied extensively under malik and under al-layth students was reported to have observed that al-layth was a greater jurist than malik but his students neglected him Right. Can you see this now? Now, Imam Shafi, who actually took over him when he died, actually studied under him. So under, under his students, sorry, under uh, under a life students. So the fact that Imam Shafi became more powerful than him, it doesn't mean that he was no good. Because if 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 he wasn't good, then Imam, Imam Shafi would not have been studying under his his students. Yeah, mm -hmm. and also he said he observed that Imam Al Layth was greater jurist than Imam Malik. And he studied under both of them. But it is his students who didn't take who didn't take his work forward. You see, they didn't take his word forward. They didn't write the, down his word. So he's giving the reason now why Aleph's some teachings were not found. Um, uh, although Aleph was a greater jurist than Malik, but his students uh, um, uh, neglected him. Okay, we move on now to another not known uh, madhab, yeah, which is the Thaw the Thawri madhab. Okay. okay. The Thawri madhab. The founder, Imam Ath Thawri. 719 through 777 777 CE. Imam Sufyan Athari was born Sufyan. in Kufa. Sufyan, Sufyan. Sufyan. Just, 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 just give me two seconds, please. Yeah? Okay, okay. Carry on reading, carry on reading, but just give All me right. two seconds, please. All right. Imam Sufyan Athari was born in Kufa in the year 719 CE. After an extensive study of hadith and fiqh, became the main fiqh scholar. He became, became and became fiqh. Wait. After an extensive study of hadith and fiqh, he became the main fiqh scholar of hadith school in Kufa. He held similar views to those of his contemporary, Abu Hanifa. However, he opposed the latter use of the kiyas and the istisan. There occurred between Imam Sufyan and officials of the Abbasid state a series of confrontations due to his outspoken nature and his refusal to support state politics, which contradicted the Sharia and the Sharia. Caliph al-Mansur, ruled 759 through 754 CE, sent a letter to Imam Athari requesting him to accept the post of Qadi of Kufa on condition that he not make any judgment or ruling in opposition to the state policy. Okay, can we just stop there for a minute? I was looking on my bookshelf. I'm sure I had a book which was the biography of Imam uh, Sufyan al-Thawri among the books mm. that I have. I've got Imam al-Tirmidhi. I've got a, a few other. Um, I saw, but because I didn't have time now, I was looking quickly. Maybe I, I didn't find it. But I actually have a, have a book of, uh, you know, I have different books of these um, imams. So he was somebody who was actually uh, well-known. And as it says here, like, you know, after an extensive study of hadith and fiqh, he became the fiqh 
main thick scholar of the Hadith school in, in Kufa. Now we've got a different region now. We've got a different area now. When we talk of Imam al Layth, that was in Egypt, and he now is in Kufa. Kufa, which is in Iraq. He held similar views to those of his contemporary. Imam Abu Hanifa, however, he opposed the latter's use of Qiyas and uh, Isihsan. Now, you see now, although they... Um, the first part, the first, the Quran and the Sunnah were the same amongst them. The other parts, sometimes they didn't agree with using that because obviously, as as scholars, they've studied and they, you know they they found that we shouldn't be using this, we should be using that, and sometimes they 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 disagreed on that. It doesn't mean that them you know there was anything wrong with them. Okay, there occurred between Imam Sir Sufyan Sufyan and officials of the Abbasid uh, state a series of confrontations of his outspoken nature and his refusal to uh, support the, the state policies which contradicted the sharia now we see that they reached a point they were among the they were in times of the government where some of the government's views opposed the sharia yeah mm -hmm. and imam imam authority got into confrontations not just him we will see how other other imams as well got into confrontations with these um, uh, leaders because they didn't want to say things that were not uh, not uh, in the sharia but the leaders wanted them to, 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 to say this. And obviously they will have problems. Some of them escaped, some of them were beaten, some of them were killed and whatever. So, you know, if, if the Sharia says, says, says A and the government is ruling according to B and the government forces you saying like, you know, you have to say B and you say, no, I, I'm not, you know, this is haram basically. So this is when the conflict started. And mm. Caliph al-Ma'moon sent a letter to Imam al Authority requested him to accept the post of Qadi. Now, to accept the post, which means that you become a government scholar. You see, mm -hmm. if, if, you, if, you're, if you're accepting this post now, whatever the government says, you have to, to accept. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and um, uh, so he uh, obviously, like you know, he because uh, although although he was in confrontation with them, now to try and get him in their hands, uh, Caliph al, uh, al Mansur sent him a letter, requested him to accept the post of Qadi. Qadi is a judge. Yeah, mm -hmm. of Kufa, on condition that he he makes he, he does not make any judgment or ruling in opposition to the state policy. So it had to be quiet on every, uh, everything, even if the, the 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 state is going wrong or whatever. He would have to keep quiet about it. Okay, um, carry on, sister, on receipt. All right, on receipt of the letter, Sufian tore it up and threw it into the Tigris River in disgust. But as a result. He was forced to give up his teaching and flee for his life. He remained in hiding until he died in the year 777 CE. Right. Exactly what I said to you now. A lot of these um, uh, scholars, they had to run away. They had to, like, you know, leave their teachings and everything. <clears throat> Why? Because pressure was put on them now. The, these, these, these caliphs who came after the, 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 the three, three generations that the Prophet ﷺ had mentioned, you know, the Prophet ﷺ said that the, 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 um, uh, the, the three best generations are my generation and the one that is to come and the one that is uh, to come. So after these, there were a lot of them that, uh, that were getting diluted. And they wanted these scholars, these well-known scholars, to accept their, their way of ruling as Sharia when it was not. So obviously, mm -hmm. when he received that letter now, he tore it and he threw it in the, in the, in the Tigris River in disgust. And he was forced to give up his teaching because now you've 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 actually refused to work for the for, for the for the for the for the caliph. So what to do? You have to flee for your life. Yeah. Mm. And he remained in hiding until he died in the year seven seven seven. Okay. So there now the reasons for the madhab's uh, madhab's disappearance. The two main factors are as follows: a) the imam spent the greater part of his life in hiding and thus was unable to attract a large number of students who might subsequently spread his opinions in the circles of learning. Okay, this is a very important mm. thing now. Very, very important. We must choose when we are, when we are taking knowledge who to take it from. We can't just take knowledge from uh, this and that and the other. Uh, an imam like him, his knowledge was so precious. He did not want to say things that were wrong. He would he had preferred to spend all his life in hiding, running here and there, than to say, mm. yes, you can do this, yes, you can do that, or we can change this, we can change that. Uh, you see? So mm -hmm. when we do take knowledge, I remember one brother mentions it quite often, um, uh, when uh, knowledge is like food, yeah? You have to pick what type of food you want you eat. You don't just eat anything. 
you yeah. know so 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 when you when, when you're picking your knowledge make sure you pick your, your knowledge from from scholars who are reputable scholars scholars who like you know you know that like you know they're they're they're, they're you know they've done a lot of work they spent a lot of time and they are well known scholars who have not you know said, said things against them the 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 sharia that's how you you pick your scholars and imam the, the reason why his madhab disappeared is because he spent most of his life running away hiding from mm. from the the, the the, the what's the name of uh, uh, hiding from the from the caliph from the so, caliph so he was not able to attract a large number of students yeah? wow so carry on. okay b although he did carry out some fairly extensive compilation of hadiths and their interpretations he requested in his will that his main student amar ibn Saif, erase all his writings and burn whatever could not be erased Amar dutifully destroyed his teaching, teacher's writings, but many of the imam's ideas were recorded by students of other imams. So imams. They, imams, so they have survived till today, but not in any organized form. Right. You see, so hmm. so what he actually gave the order to his student to burn, or because the thing is, what would have happened is the governments, these 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 scholars would have who would have raised, they would have taken that as the law of the land. Now, if it's if wow. it was still available, they would have said that, like you know, Imam uh, uh, Imam. Uh, 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 who, who are we talking about? Imam Athori. Imam, Imam Athori oh, said this. Oh, Imam Athori really? said that. Like, you know, so even if he was not available, even if he was not here, and what they could have done as well, they could have taken his teachings and forced his students to act upon which he, he refused to act. So what wow. happened now? He 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 told his student to burn all his uh, uh, works and to erase all of his writings. Of the, a, uh, to to erase all his works and to burn that that couldn't could not be erased. So mm -hmm. you can see how how sincere these scholars were. So when we see that his his madhab is not here anymore, it's not because his madhab was no good. And there are still, like I said, I have his. Um, I have to look around for it. But I have his his, his biography. So he mm -hmm. must have been somebody who was very well organized somebody who was very very good for his um, uh, biography to, to, to have been written yeah anyway, so we i'm um, so far so good sister yeah yes so far so good good alhamdulillah if there is any questions for anybody i can't see anybody in the maybe not everybody's caught on to the time to change uh, i don't know because it's a weekend but but anyway whoever's there if you have any any questions um anyway sister next um, okay. The Shafi Madhab, who is very well known. We all know of Imam Shafi, and we've spoken about him several times. Even in this process that we're talking about, them other Imams not them uh, uh, surviving. The name of Imam Shafi has has come up a few times. So we will see now who is Imam Shafi. The Shafi Madhab, founder Imam Ash Shafi, seven sixty nine through eight twenty C E. The full name of the scholar after whom this school of legal thought has been named was Muhammad ibn Idris Ashafi. He was born in the town Gaza on the Mediterranean coast of what was then known as Sham in the year, Sham, in the year 796 CE. All right, Gaza, 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 Gaza is, what in, is, is in Palestine Gaza. today. Gaza, yes. Gaza. Gaza, Gaza. Okay. Ra, Ra. Ra, Ra. Raza, yeah, Raza, Raza. Raza. Okay. so today 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 you hear you hear in Palestine a lot of the the people from Gaza they're getting tortured they're getting beaten yes. or whatever this is where he's from okay okay and in that time it was known as Sham Sham okay the, the whole of Syria Palestine uh, all the, these areas around were known as Sham okay it was known as Sham in the year 796 CE, but traveled to Medina in his youth to study fiqh and hadith under Imam Malik. He succeeded in memorizing the whole of Malik's book, Al, Al Muatta, and recited it to him from memory. Word perfect. Subhanallah. Subhanallah. You see, Subhanallah. you see these imams that we are talking about now, these imams, they were they were they were not just like you know, uh petty imams who were like, you know, here and there. No, from very young they were studying, and like I did mention before. A lot of them were not studying medicine. They couldn't afford to study medicine. They couldn't afford to study all these sciences. And a lot of these sciences had not come up in the in those times. Uh, you know, so most of them were involved in studying the dean. And the dean was spreading. The dean was spreading at that time. And they needed the the, the these imams. And he traveled to Medina 
in his youth to study not only fiqh but hadith under Imam Malik. And he succeeded in memorizing Imam Malik's book, Al Muatta, which is a very, very beautiful book. And he recited him to uh, recited it to him from memory, word perfect. So can you imagine the 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 the, the memory that Allah subhanahu wa gave these scholars now? Mm. See, Allah gave these scholars such a, such a memory. And today we'll be bickering over little bits and pieces here and there, making as if we know better than them. Like, you know, yet the memory that Allah, that Allah gave these scholars, that he actually learned his book, Al Muatta. Al Muatta is not a joke. It's, it's, it's not like, you know, uh, uh, something that you can learn that easily. Yet he, he learned it and recited it for, from, from memory. So um, we can put Imam Shafi among the top of the, 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 the madhabs kind of thing. Okay. Ashafi remained under Malik until the latter died in 801 CE. Then he went to Yemen and taught there. He remained there until he was accused of Shiite, right? Mm -hmm. Leanings in the year 805 CE and brought as a prisoner before Abbas Abbasid Caliph Harun al Rashid, ruled 786 through 809 CE in Iraq. Fortunately, he was able to prove the correctness of his beliefs and was subsequently released. As Shafi remained in Iraq and studied for a while under Imam Muhammad ibn al Hassan, the famous student of Abu Hanifa. Later, he traveled to Egypt in order to study under Imam Muhammad ibn al Hassan, the famous student of Abu Hanifa. Later, he traveled to Egypt. In, wait, later, he I traveled to Egypt under Imam Al Layth. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Later, mm -hmm. he studied in, to travel to Egypt in order to study under Imam Al Layth. But by the time he reached there, the Imam had passed away. However, he was able to study the Madhab of Al Layth from Al Layth's students. As Sha'afi remained in Egypt until his death in the year 820 CE. During the rule of the Caliph Al Mamun, rule eight thirteen through eight thirty two CE. Right, I think that bottom bit there that we uh, spoke about was mentioned in, in Imam Al Latham. Uh, uh story at the top as well that when he died imam shafi took over his teachings and he, he studied from from his students so this is um uh, obviously now we're talking about imam shafi so this is rep being repeated so he studied under uh, imam alayf students yeah and um, until he died so we can see now the power the, the caliber of these of, of these imams now and like mm -hmm. i mentioned to you we might have four imams but it doesn't mean that these four imams were the only ones that were around there were Right. other imams who were more powerful and now we're talking about about a very powerful um, uh, imam which is um, uh, imam uh, shafi okay now the formation of the shafi madhab the formation of the shafi madhab imam ashafi imam ashafi combined the fiqh of hijaz Ma maliki thought with that of Iraq, Hanafi thought, and created a new madhab which he dictated to his students in the form of a book called al huja the evidence. This dictation took place in Iraq in the year 810 CE, and a number of his students memorized his book and narrated it to others. Okay, if we could just stop here for a minute. Mm -hmm. Now, Imam Shafi combined Maliki Madhab with Hanafi Madhab. Mm -hmm. So, meaning that these Madhabs all were talking of the same thing, basically. Mm -hmm. You know, Today, we will have a masjid who is across the, uh, the road. This is a Hanafi masjid. We'll have another masjid uh, who's there. This is a, a Maliki masjid. We'll have another, you know. Today, we are making it so difficult amongst us as if these were enemies, these were whatever. Right. But when we read the stories of these imams, we can see that they studied under the same imams. And the story of Imam Shafi, he actually combined these mm -hmm. the, the, these um, uh, schools of thought, yeah, mm -hmm. and he actually uh, created a new uh, a new madhab, which um, which he dictated uh, to to his student, and this book is still available. Al Hujja obviously is one of his um, uh, one one of Imam Shafi's um, uh, well known writings. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. This book and period of his scholarship are usually referred to as Al Madhab Al Qadim, the old school of thought to differentiate it from the second period of his scholarship, which occurred after he reached Egypt. In Egypt, he absorbed the fiqh of Imam al-Layth ibn Sa'ad and dictated al-Madhab al-Jadid, the new school of thought, to his students in the form of another book, which he named al-Um. He essence, okay. the essence. The essence, the essence, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you see now, he, st he, he studied under um, uh, Imam Malik and he studied under Imam Shafi and he called that the old school. 
He had the old school of, the, mm -hmm. of thought. Then when he studied under Imam al now he called that the new school of thought. So mm -hmm. again, they were all studying under one another and their thoughts were the same. And the reason why sometimes there was differences between them, maybe a, a hadith didn't re reach him a certain imam, or maybe a certain imam was not happy with the way that that hadith was being narrated. He didn't trust the person who was narrating these hadith or whatever. So mm -hmm. these were the main, main differences between them. But their differences were not things that people would divide the ummah over. Okay. Okay. Because of this exposure to a completely new set of hadiths and legal reasonings, in Al Madhab Al Jadid, he reversed many of the legal positions which he had held while in Iraq. Imam Al Shafi holds the distinction of being the first Imam to systematize the fundamental principles of fiqh, which he recorded in his book called Arisla. Arisala. 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 Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Sources of law used by the Shafi Madhab. One, the Quran. A Shafi did not differ from the previously mentioned Imams in their uncompromising stand in relation to the primary primacy of the Quran, among other sources of Islamic law. He relied on it as heavily as those before him, adding only the new insights which he gained from a deep study of its meaning. Two, the Sunnah. Imam Ashafi laid down only one condition for the acceptance of hadiths, namely that they be authentic, siha, sahih, sahih, and rejected all other conditions set by Imams Abu Hanifa and Malik. He was also noted for his great contributions to the science of hadith criticism. Right. Okay. So as we see, okay. as we see, as we see these two, like I keep mentioning, these two, the Quran and Sunnah has always been the the, the two pr primary sources that the Imams took. Uh, um, Sister Geneva is with us. Salam alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sister Geneva, I hope you have a, you had a nice Eid. And um, like I said, the Saturday we didn't we didn't actually do the class because it was Eid. And I hope now you'll 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 be able to adapt with the change of of, of timing, Saturday and Sunday. And um, I hope you benefit fit again from it. So again, like I like, I'm just uh, repeating now, these two uh, first ones, all of them you will find, all of them follow this, uh, the, the same thing. Now we'll move to the other other ones. Okay. Three, Ijma. Although Asharia had serious doubts. I, I, no, Ashar this is a, sha a Shafi. A Shafi. Okay. <laughs> Although Ashafi had serious doubts about the possibility of Ijma in a number of cases, he conceded that in the few cases where it was known to have occurred, it should be regarded as the third most important source of Islamic law. Right. Individual yeah. opinions of the Sahaba. Credence was given by Imam Ashafi to the individual opinions of the Sahaba on condition that they were not a variance with each other. If there were conflicting opinions among the Sahaba on legal point, he, like Abu Hanifa, would choose whichever opinion was the closest to the source and leave the rest. Kiyas. Right. Okay, now, when we're talking about the opinions of the Sahaba now, although the Sahaba got their sources from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, but there are times that they could differ as well. Maybe, you know, one was not with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or one, he Ma saw the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam do something, and the others didn't, you see? Your, your sound is gone. No, no, you don't, you don't, uh, I can't hear you. No. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Right. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Okay, so so this is why now, like, you know, when, when we talk of the uh, uh, individual opinion, not of the ijma of the of the Sahaba, but the, indiv the individual opinions, there could have been one Sahaba who was wrong and the other one was right. Uh, so, like, you know, obviously, like, you know, they would see which one was the closest to the source and leave the rest. When they say the source now, it means we're coming from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay. Okay. Five, Kiyas. Kiyas was, in the imam's opinion, a valid method for deducing for the laws from the previous sources. However, he placed it last in order of importance, considering his personal opinions inferior to proofs based on the opinions of the companions. Is this hab? Is this hab? Yes. Both the principle and both the principle 
Istisan, used by Abu Hanifa, and Istisla, used by Malik, were rejected by Ash-Shafi and considered a form of bidah innovation. Since, in his opinion, they were based mostly on human reasoning in areas where revealed laws had already existed. However, in dealing with similar issues, Ash-Shafi was obliged to use principles similar to Istisan, and Istisla, which he called Istishab, Istishab literally means seeking a link, but legally it refers to the process of deducing fiqh laws by linking a later set of circumstances with an earlier set. It is okay. based okay. on. If okay. we could just two minutes, we just stop here. Huh? Mm -hmm. We see up here it says that he actually uh, he actually rejected a Shafi and uh, sorry he actually rejected Abu Hanifa and uh, Imam Malik's um, uh, opinions. Right, uh, he called them innovation. He's not talking about what the, what they took from the Quran. He's not talking about what they took from from the Sunnah. He's not talking about what they um, uh, took from the Ijma of the of the Sahaba here. He's talking of their own personal opinions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we have to understand that. So we don't think, oh, he just said that they, that he he agreed with them, and then now it's saying that he he uh, went against them. No, he went against some of the stuff that they took as their own personal opinion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the difference. But when it came to the actual Quran, Sunnah, and and the actual ijma of the Sahaba, then he would he would have agreed with them on that. Yeah. And in dealing with and he had he had his his uh, uh, he the um, uh, Abu Hanifa uh, called it uh, istihsan, and Imam Malik called it istislah, and he called it is istihsan. Yeah. Um, no, he. he called, it's this hub, sorry, he called mm -hmm. it it's this hub. And um, uh, we can see the meaning and everything is going, which is called a link, seeking a link between what is um, uh, legally uh, useful for, for the deductions. Although the, 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 the process was, was the same, but there were certain differences in there. But then when I say, for example, that like, you know, um, they had some uh, difference, again, it is not differences that caused major um, uh, separation major problems major divisions or whatever okay it is based on the assumption that the fiqh laws applicable to certain conditions remain valid so long as it is not certain that these conditions have altered if for example on account of the long absence of someone it is doubtful whether he is alive or dead then by its his have all rules must remain in force that would hold if one knew for certain that he was still alive. Okay, so this is one of the examples. This is one of the examples that is given of his, um, uh, you know, what he took and everything. What, what, he, what he meant um, uh, by is the, is this hub. This is one of the examples that is, that is given. Okay, we move to uh, one of his main students, Imam Shafi's uh, students. We will go, we'll go through one of his main students now. Well, some of his main students. Main students of Shafi Madhab. The most important of Imams as Shafi students who continued to follow his school of thought were Al Muzani, Arabi, and Yusuf ibn Yah Yahya. Yahya, okay. Yahya. Al Muzani, 791 through 876 CE. Al Muzani's full name was Imail ibn. No, I think it's Ismail. Huh? I think there's a mistake. Yeah. Oh, sometimes, Ismail? sometimes the sheikhs when they write, sometimes may Allah forgive them, you know. Or maybe this was not the actual final copy, so he had it checked out before it went out on the market, like you know. So um, uh, okay. I'm, 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 I'm sure that these uh, errors have been checked out anyway. So anyway, so it's Ismail. Ismail, Ismail ibn Yahya al Muzani. He was the constant companion of Imam al-Shafi throughout his stay in Egypt. Al-Muzani was noted for writing a book which comprehensively gathered the fiqh of al-Shafi, later condensed under the title Muqtasal al-Muzani. Muqtasal al-Muzani, which is a well-known book in the Arab circuits. And um, obviously, I don't know if it's been translated into, into English, but um, it's one of the books that he wrote. Okay. It became the most widely read fiqh book of the Shafi Madhab. Okay. Right. Arabi al Maradi, 790 through 873 CE. Arabi was noted for the main narrator of a Shafi's book, Al Um. He wrote it down during Imam Al Shafi's lifetime along with 
Arasala, and other books. Okay, so we see now the difference between the imams who made it and became very prominent and the imams who didn't make it. The, the imams who didn't make it, their books were not uh, written down and there was no access between them and like, you know, the other people. Whereas these imams now, Imam, Imam Shafi, his students were very, very prevalent. You know, they, they mm -hmm. wrote his books and like, you know, um, his books were known to others as well. So this is what made them rise compared to other imams who were good imams, but unfortunately, their, uh, their writings were not written down. And as we read them earlier on, we'd seen the different reasons, and we'll see other reasons as well. Anyway, carry on, sister. Yusuf ibn Yahya al-Buwaiti. Yusuf ibn Yahya succeeded Ashafis as the main teacher of the Madhab. He was imprisoned and tortured to death in Baghdad because he rejected the officially sanctioned Mutazilite philosophy on the creation of the Quran. Mm. Right. Okay. So we see now, we see that even um, his student, who was a very prominent student, who took over after him, was actually imprisoned and tortured because the government that was ruling us at the time was a Mu'tazilite government. And I think we, 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 we've been going through that in the, in the, in the um, Aqidah lessons about the Mu'tazilite and the, whether, the way they believe about the creation and everything and the Qur'an, uh, mm -hmm. whether, the, the, whether the, the, the Qur'an is created and stuff like that, you know. So because of his, his, his opinion on that, he was imprisoned and uh, killed in, in, in prison. Mm -hmm. Okay. Followers of the Sha'afi Madhab. The majority of the followers of the Sha'afi Madhab are now to be found in Egypt, Southern Arabia, Yemen, Hadramut, Sri Lanka, Indonesia, Malaysia, and East Africa, Kenya, and Tanzania, and the Suriname in South America. Right, okay. So this now ends about Imam Shafi. So we can see how Imam Shafi, being among the, the, the prominent scholars about his students, about what happened to his teachings and whatever. And we can see that although Imam Shafi's teachings carried on, you know, because he had prominent students, but unfortunately, one of his um, uh, students, who was uh, Yusuf bin, uh, bin Yahya al Buwaiti, was actually imprisoned and killed. Now, if, 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 for example, that had happened to Imam Shafi, today probably we wouldn't have much of the teachings of, of Imam Shafi. This happened to one of his students. So it means that his teachings prevailed. And then when his student took over, by that time his teachings had already been known, had already been written, had already been, been compiled and everything. Then when his student took over, unfortunately, uh, may, Allah, uh, say, may, may Allah reward him, may Allah give him Jannah, inshallah. And he was one of those who like you know, was actually uh, imprisoned and beaten or whatever. Okay, now we move to Imam um, uh, Hanbal, uh, Imam Ahmed uh, bin Hanbal, another major, um, uh, another major uh, madhab among the four madhabs that uh, you're, you're hearing. You'll be hearing Imam, Imam uh, Ahmed bin, bin Hanbal's name as well. So carry on, sister, from the Hanbali madhab. Okay, the Hanbali madhab. The founder, Imam Ahmad, 778 through 855 CE. The scholar whom to whom this madhab is attributed is Ahmad ibn Hanbal as Shaibani, who was born in Baghdad in the year 778 CE. He became one of the great memorizers and narrators of Hadith of his time. Concentrating on the study of Hadith, Ahmad studied fiqh and Hadith science under Imam Abu Yusuf, the famous student of Abu Hanifa, as well as under Imam Ashafi Al himself. Okay, and so if we stop there for mm -hmm. a minute. Now, we're talking about a major imam, and he studied under the student of uh, uh, Imam Abu Hanifa, who is Imam Abu Yusuf, and he studied also under Imam Shafi, you see. So again, be, being part of the four major madhabs, he studied under one of the major madhabs as well. So he studied under Imam Shafi himself. So again, mm -hmm. like I said, the, the, the people today, the divisions, uh, the, the, I keep pointing this out because it's something that is very important, because when you travel the world today, you'll find people will be talking and, 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 and you know, I'm a Shafi, I'm, 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 I'm a Hanbali or whatever, and they will mm -hmm. give much more importance to these madhabs as if, as if these madhabs are much more important than, than, than what the Prophet Sallallahu taught. Right. And sometimes they will reject what the Prophet Sallallahu uh, said, and they will take on uh, what, the, what the madhab said. But these people were uh, students of, of one another, as mm -hmm. we've seen, and like you know, Imam Ahmad here, Imam Ahmad bin, uh, bin Hanbal is a very, very well known um, uh, scholar. You will see his books in, in, in 
several of, them are, uh, of uh, writings of other scholars, and he has written uh, a lot of uh, good books as well. So if we carry on, Imam Ahmed. Imam Ahmed went through a series of persecutions under the caliphs of his time due to their adoption of Mutazilite philosophy. He was jailed and beaten for two years by order by the order of the Caliph Al Mamun, rule eight thirteen through eight thirteen through eight forty two CE, because of his rejection of the philosophical concept that the Quran was created. Later set free, he continued teaching in Baghdad until Al Wathiq became Caliph, rule eight forty two through eight forty six CE, and renewed the persecution. Thereupon, Imam Ahmed stopped teaching and went into hiding for five years until Caliph al Mutawakil, 847 through 862 CE, took over. Caliph al Mutawakil ended, ended the Inquisition permanently by expelling the Mutazilite scholars and officially rejecting their philosophy. Ahmad continued to teach in Baghdad until he died in the year 855 CE. Right. Again, it is mentioned of the issue because the Mutazilites, they believe that the Quran was, uh, was, uh, was created. They believe that the Quran is not the word of Allah and that the, the, the Quran uh, was created. And obviously they, were, they, they had forced um, uh, Imam, Imam Ahmed to, uh, to uh, preach uh, this type of thing. So he had he'd been he'd been in hiding, and uh, only when the when the caliph had changed, caliph uh, caliph al mutawakkil then he got rid of all the 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 Mutazilite scholars and made it official now that um, uh, that uh, Imam Ahmed, like you know, was 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 the official teacher, the teacher. So so the uh, the 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 Ahl Sunnah teaching came back again. After the Mutazilite scholars had and, uh, had been rejected, and then because they, they 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 used mainly philosophy in their in their in the Mutazilites used mainly philosophy in the in their teachings. Anyway, the formation of the Hanbali uh, Madhab. Formation of the Hanbali Madhab. Imam Ahmad's greatest concern was the collection of narration and interpretation of hadith. His teaching method consisted of dictating the hadiths. From his vast collection known as Al Musnad. Al Musnad. Okay, this is Al Musnad is still with us today. We have a lot of, of hadith from uh, Musnad uh, Imam Ahmad, and it was one of the one of the great books of, of hadith among the, the the books that that we have. And it says here it contains over thirty thousand thirty thousand hadith. Carry on. Okay, which contained over 30,000 hadiths as well as the various opinions of the Sahaba concerning their interpretation. He would then apply the hadiths or rulings to various existing problems. If he could not find a suitable hadith or opinion to solve a problem, he would offer his own opinion while forbidding his students to record any of his own solutions. As a result, his madhab was recorded, not by his students, but by their students. Okay, so we can see again that, that, that now that he's using hadith, yeah, a lot of hadith, 30,000 hadith, and he's using these hadith to, to give his rulings, yeah, to find suitable, um, to find the suitable rulings. So he used the Quran and he used the um, hadith. And his teachings, as we can see here, was not actually written down by his direct students, but his, but the students that came after him. And Al-Musnad Al Al Ahmad is a very well-known um, book of hadith, which has been translated into English. So there is his collection of hadith in English. Sources of law used by the Hanbali Madhab. One, the Quran. There was no difference between the way Ahmad ibn Hanbal approached Quran and that of those who preceded him. In other words, the Quran was given precedence over all else under all circumstances. Number two, the Sunnah. Likewise, the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam occupied the number two positions among the fundamental principles used by the founder of this school of the deduction of laws. His only stipulation was that it be, is that marfu? Marfu, yeah, marfu. Marfu, mm -hmm. i.e. attributed directly to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Mm -hmm. Number three, Ijma of the Sahaba. Imam Ahmad recognized the consensus of the, of the opinion, I'm sorry, the, the opinion of the Sahaba and placed it in the third position among the fundamental principles. However, he discredited the claims of Ijma outside the era of the Sahaba as being inaccurate 
due to the vast number of scholars and their wide diffusion throughout the Muslim empire. In his opinion, Ijma after the area of the Sahaba was impossible. Okay, um, uh, just just for a second. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, brother Bird's Nest Rat Fest. Um, I hope everything's okay. I hope you I hope you had a good Eid as well. And let's go, go back to this now. Now his his ijma was the ijma of the Sahaba only. He wouldn't take anything uh, apart from from the Sahaba. So he would stick only to the ijma of the Sahaba, not of the Tabi'in and the Tabi Tabi'in, like the three generations that the Prophet had mentioned. He was very careful of uh, where he was um, uh, taking. So the Sahaba of the after he took uh, the Quran and Sunnah, the ijma of the Sahaba was where he stopped at. Mm -hmm. Okay, next. The yeah, individual, individual opinions of the Sahaba. If a problem arose in an area where the, the Sahaba had expressed conflicting opinions, Ahmad, like Malik, would give credence to all the various individual opinions because of that, there developed within the Madhab many instance instances of multiple rulings for individual issues. Right. Okay. Number so I think five. that this is un this is understandable that, mm -hmm. like you know, um, if a problem arose in an area where the Sahaba had expressed conflicting opinions, and again, not him alone, but there was Imam Malik who took the, the, this this opinion as well, to all the, uh, that they would mm -hmm. give credence to all the individual opinions. Okay, so uh, this is clear. Okay, this is something that we need to note now, number five. Mm -hmm. We need to note something very important here. Okay, hadith da'if. Hadith da'if. Hadith da'if, or weak hadith, for a ruling on a case where none of the previous four principles offered a ready solution. The imam used to prefer to use a weak hadith rather than applying his own deductive reasoning, kiyas. However, this was on condition that the weakness of the hadith was not due to the fact of one of its narrators was classified as fasik, degenerate, as kada'ab, liar. Okay, so we can see that now, yeah? He used weak hadith over his own personal uh, uh, de deduction. So that's, why, that's, the, the, that's the reason why he used it. He didn't use weak hadith just to use the weak hadith or whatever. And then like, no, he used it on, uh, he gave it preference over his own opinion. And for uh, two conditions though, that again, if somebody was, was a de degenerate, a liar, and like, you know, he would not use his hadith. Um, uh, so a de degenerate and a liar, kadhab. Kadhab is, is a liar and a facet is somebody who who goes against Islam, who does things against Islam, like you know, and uh, he narrates the hadith. We know straight away that this person's hadith would not be taken. So although Imam, um, Imam Ahmed used weak hadith, but he used it over his own uh, deductive reasoning, over his own qiyas. Okay. Number six, qiyas. As a last resort, that is when no other major principle could be directly applied. Ahmad would reluctantly apply the principle of Kiyas and deduce a solution based on one or more of the previous principles. Okay, now we're talk when 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 we're talking about uh, we have to remember now we are going we're we're, we're talking about fiqh. Here, yeah, we're not talking about normal hadith or whatever where you see that today that a lot of non Muslims just take out a hadith and throw at us. This is fiqh. So, when he's trying to get a ruling from the fiqh now, he's gone through such and such stage and he still doesn't find that um, answer. Then, the last resort, he resorts to qiyas, he resorts to his own uh, deduction to find a solution based on that. If on all these fives above he cannot find the solution, then he leaves qiyas as the last option the last resort um, because obviously this is this is fit we're talking about the actual uh, uh jurisprudence laws you know taking the from uh, if we go way back from the beginning when we spoke about the sharia being one thing and the fit being another thing the sharia doesn't doesn't change but the fit can change depending on time and circumstance and everything and this is why when he was giving his um, rulings he left qiyas as the last resort when there's nothing else he couldn't find anything else than he was he and he says here he would reluctantly apply, um, uh, apply the principle of Qiyas. Today you find people are coming up uh, who are like, you know, scholars. They've read a few books and khalas. they become scholars today. They're, 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 they're giving, <laughs> they're giving uh, a fatwa about this and fatwa about that or whatever. We can see how careful these, imam, uh, these imams were. Mm -hmm. How careful not to do something. You know, you know, he had to come down to six to Qiyas to, lose, to use his own uh, deductions. Uh, 
deductions, mm -hmm. not his own opinion. Today you do see people talking, what's your opinion on this? What's your opinion on that? No, we don't use our opinions. And, and they stick to it themselves. like it's law. Exactly, exactly. You're right about that. Yes, you know? And and it's not finished. They will go around and ask others as well. What's your opinion? What's your opinion? You know, it's not a real mm -hmm. issue of opinion. Islam is not based on opinion. Islam is based on facts. And mm -hmm. these imams, they only resort uh, re, uh, re, resorted to their um, uh, opinion when they couldn't find anything else. You know, we have books and books and books and volumes and volumes and volumes that have been written by the imam, but to, uh, imams, but today we will give our opinion. You know, this is the thing. Okay, so if we I carry mean, on. Main students of the Hanbali, Hanbali Madhab, Imam Ahmad's main students were his own two sons, Salih died in 873 CE and Abdullah died in 903 CE. Imam Bukhari and Muslim compilers of the most outstanding collections of hadith were among the great scholars of hadith who studied under Imam Ahmad. Okay, now you see Imam Bukhari, who is supposed to be the top when it comes to uh, uh, hadith, mm -hmm. and Imam Muslim, Muslim, the two major hadith compilers, actually studied under Imam Ahmad. See, so we see that they were all. Um, uh, that's that's why you will see when when you read a, a hadith, you can see the hadith being narrated by Imam Bukhari. It will be narrated by Imam Muslim. It will be uh, narrated by Imam Ahmad uh, bin Hanbal. You will see it in so many different places because they were they 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 studied um, under one another and they shared the same hadith. The reasons they would differ is because maybe that hadith didn't come to them or they didn't trust the person who uh, narrated the hadith or whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay. Followers of the Hanbali Madhab. The majority of the followers of this Madhab can now be found in, Palatine, in Sal uh, Palestine. Is it Palestine? Palestine. Palestine and Saudi Arabia. Its survival in Saudi Arabia, after almost completely dying out elsewhere in the Muslim world, is due to the fact that the founder of the so called Wahhabi, is that right? Or so, Wahhab. Uh, Wahhab. Wahhab had yeah, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will explain this in a minute now. Who was um, okay. okay? Hello. Had studied under scholars of Hambly Madhab of the Hambly Madhab, and thus it unofficially became the Fiq Madhab of the movement. When Abdul Aziz Ibn Saud captured most of the Arabian Peninsula and established the Saudi dynasty, he made the Hambly Madhab the basis of the kingdom's legal system. Okay, let's go back to this now. We're talking about um, the, so the, the, the founder, of, uh, uh, which is the so-called Wahhab. Imam Ibn, Ibn Abdul Wahhab, his name was Muhammad Ibn Abdul Wahhab. Today, when somebody doesn't like what the Salaf is uh, preaching, when they don't like what the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah is preaching, they give them the title of Wahhabi. You know, they are Wahhabis, mm. right? Now, Wahhab was not his name. Wahhab was his father's it. name. Okay, Wahhab was his father's name. His name was Muhammad Ibn Abdul Wahhab. I got a book here that was given to me, alhamdulillah, by one great scholar. He um, uh, he sent me this book which he had written about um, uh, Imam uh, Ibn Abdul Wahhab. For those of you who can get hold of it, for those of you who can get hold of it, please do. It's a very good book. It is called mm. Muhammad Ibn Abdul Wahhab. Yeah, and it is written by uh, Sheikh um, um, uh, by, by Sheikh. Uh, yeah, Jalal Abu Rub. Jalal Abu Rub is a very, very good uh, scholar. I have another book that is written by him, which I've actually left in, in my sitting room, which he actually, which he actually calls the um, the Jewish Temple rebuilt by the Jew the Jewish Temple rebuilt by the Shias. Very, very good book. Yeah, mm. um, interesting. So, so we we can see now now that Imam Ibn Abdul Wahhab was a reformer. Because in Saudi Arabia, it reached a time when people were going towards bid'ah, they were going to things that they should not follow. And Imam Ibn Abdul, Abdul Wahhab came only to reform. But today, those who don't like him, they will uh, name people who are following the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah or who are following um, uh, uh, the Salaf, they will uh, nickname them Wahhabis. Wahhabi is not a term, never, exist, uh, never existed wow. before. Actually, his father was called Wahhab. Right, and, and one of Allah's name is Al-Wahhab. Okay, so if you're going to call me a Wahhabi, I'll be happy because I'm one of the followers, uh, one of the followers of Al-Wahhab. 
Okay. So See, what uh, is the problem with this teaching? Why do people speak against it so much? Because I've heard because, so much about this. Because of the fact that there, were, there, there was a time before he came that Saudi Arabia itself, as it mentions here, yeah, um, uh, he, uh, he studied under, under the scholars of, uh, of the Hanbali Madhab, and thus it officially became the, the fiqh madhab of the movement. When Abdul Aziz ibn Saud captured most of the um, Arabian Peninsula and established the Saudi uh, regime, he made the Hanbali madhab the, the, the basis of the kingdom. So what happened was they were following a lot of bid'ah at the time, okay, in Saudi Arabia. Yeah, people were following all sorts of them. Um, uh, and, and for them, that was the creed for them. They were totally lost. Now, when Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab came back, he started bringing them back to the true teachings. For example, I'll give you an example. Um, uh, the Prophet وسلم, sent Ali ibn Abi Talib to the, to the graveyard. And he said, any grave that is higher than the... the, the um, and the, the the man's um, uh, what do you call this uh, hand hand mm -hmm. yeah lower it okay mm -hmm. lower it today you get people go they they they've got them um, uh, the, the gravestones they've got all sorts of mausoleums or whatever mm -hmm. you see over the grave now this is bid'ah mm -hmm. this is not allowed so when Imam Ibn Abdul Wahhab came he he imposed that law he destroyed a lot of these um, uh, gravestones he brought everybody back to the teaching of the Prophet sallallahu mm -hmm. alaihi wasallam one of one of um, uh, Ali uh, one of uh, Umar bin Khattab radiyallahu anhu the, the the second um, uh, Imam he He's, uh, the second, uh, uh, sorry, uh, caliph, his brother, his brother's grave, I think they had built whatever, whatever on it, and he desecrated what was, what was extra, what was not allowed. Now, the people, because they didn't like that now, because they were going into these graves, they were worshipping graves and stuff like that, so the title Wahhabi came out. See, these guys are Wahhabi, right? So that went on. It went on and went on, and then it stayed, basically. So really, when, when, when you say somebody's a Wahhabi, it's a misdemeanor, basically, because that was the name of his father. His name was wow. Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab. And again, like, you know, for those of you, um, uh, uh, Sheikh uh, Jalal Abu Arub, Jazakallah Khair, when he found out that I was a student of Dr. Bilal Phillips, uh, he actually sent me, uh, sent, sent me this book a, a while back. And I'm thinking of inviting him on one of my shows one, one of these days because he's, he should. He's, got some be very, he's got some very, very good works. I'm trying to get hold of him. So this is the concept of the, the Wahhabi, what they call the, the Wahhabi, supposedly, like you know, the Wahhabis. A lot of Shias will call us uh, Wahhabi. A lot of the, Sunni, the, the Sufi will, will, will call us Wahhabi because of the teachings that they are following. So, and, and Imam uh, Muhammad ibn, ibn Abdul, Abdul Wahhab came and reformed that. He reformed mm. and brought us to the true teachings, which they didn't like. Okay. okay? Which they wow. didn't like, so that's why they gave that, um, uh, that title. Interesting. Okay. Right. So we're, we're, we're on the, we're on the 107 uh, time now. Let's see. Yeah, this is a short one. So we can go through this one. The, okay. the, the, the Zahiri, the Zahiri, uh, one second. Yeah, the, the Zahiri Madhab. Okay. Okay. Right. The Zahiri Madhab, the founder Imam Dawood, 815 through 883 CE. The founder of this school of thought, Dawood ibn Ali, was born in Kufa in the year 815 CE. His early fixed studies were under Imam al shafi students, but he later inclined towards the study of Hadith and joined the Hadith circle of Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal. He continued to study under Ahmad until he was expelled from Ahmad's classes because he voiced the opinion that the Quran was muda, newly existent, and therefore created after his expulsion. He took the independent path of reasoning based on the obvious and literal meanings of the text of the Quran and the Sunnah. Because of this approach, his madhab was called Dahiri Madhab, and he became known as Daiwud Ad Dahiri. Okay, so we see this madhab now. Um, one of the reasons it didn't. Um, uh, it didn't uh, survive was because uh, because of his teachings. Obviously, what mm. he believed in, he believed that the Quran, he believed that the Quran was muhdath, which is um, uh, a new invention, a yeah, new mm. existence. Yeah, and um, uh, he got he got expelled from Imam Ahmad's um, uh, teachings from his classes because of that. Yeah, and. Um, 
we, we and 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 this is why he was called his name was Imam Daoud, not not Dahir, but uh, his madhab was called the Dahiri madhab because of that, uh, because mm -hmm. of the um, the the literal meaning is Dahir. They were following the Dahiri madhab kind of thing. So we will see now um, some of the some of the uh, the sources that he took. Um, we'll go for another maybe ten minutes to that, and then we'll and then we'll we'll see, we'll finish. The Quran and the Sunnah. Like all, like all of the other Imams, Dawood considered the Quran to be the foremost source of Islamic law, followed by the Sunnah. However, only literal interpretations of their texts were con considered by him to be valid. That is, they were only to be applied in the particular circumstance which they described. Okay, it so this is what this is what I found strange. Now, if he's taking the Quran and the Sunnah. Why does why does he then divert when it comes to the to the to the Quran itself, whether mm -hmm. whether it was Muhdath, whether it was mm -hmm. newly existent? You see, so now it explains that um, uh, he took only the literal interpretation of the text, yeah, and it was considered by him to be valid. So uh, anything that he 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 took, he took it literally, and there are things that are not supposed to be taken literally. See, mm -hmm. so this is the reason why maybe he had this uh, uh, this this thinking that the Quran was n was newly existent and therefore just just been created kind of thing. Okay, so he was leaning towards uh, the Ashari, uh, the Mutazilite um, uh, way of thinking kind of thing. Anyway, next. Okay. Okay. Um, Ijma of, of the Sunnah. Sunnah. Mm -hmm. Imam Dawood gave credence to the Ijma of the Sahaba. He reasoned that their unanimity would have only been on points of law revealed to the Prophet, so Allahu alayhi wa sallam, and known to the Sahaba, but not narrated as hadiths for some reason or another. Therefore, the ijma of the Sahaba were not considered by him, him, him as resulting from reasoning, kiyas. Okay. Kiyas. Since Imam Dawood limited the application of Quran and Sunnah to their literal meaning, he automatically denied the validity of rulings based on any form of reason, opinion, including Qiyas. However, the principle of mafhum, understood meaning, which he applied to the Quran and Sunnah in place of Qiyas, turned out to be virtually indistinguishable from Qiyas and a logical deduction. Okay, so we can see, since he took the Quran and, 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 and Sunnah as uh, literal, so obviously, you know, he had them, he had problems then with the Qiyas as well, when, when he was uh, doing the rulings of the Qiyas. Now, now the principle of um, mafhum, mafhum means um, uh, something which is understood, it's clearly understood, you know, but he had some... some, some divergence in, in in his thoughts and everything and this is why his his madhab did not uh, uh, did not survive anyway the main students main students of dahari mad dahari dahiri madhab due to the limited scope of the dahiri madhab and the absence of outstanding scholars to pass on its principles and rulings it did not last very long in fact it did not get a foothold in any area of the muslim empire during imam daywood's lifetime nor in the century and a half which followed his death. In later times, all scholars who denied the validity of Kiyas were labeled Dahiris, even though they had not actually studied under Dawood or his students or even read their works. The most noted student of Dahiri Madhab was brilliant 11th century CE Spanish scholar named Ali ibn Ahmad ibn Hazm al-Andalusi, died 1070 CE, Ibn Hazm revived this madhab and defended it in the numerous outstanding works which he wrote in various fields of Islamic study. Okay, Imam, uh, Imam uh, Ibn Hazm, uh, Imam Hazm is somebody who is very well known in the in the in the Islamic circles, and he's written a lot as well. And um, we can see a lot of his books and everything. And there are things that, like you know, he said which we don't agree with, and there are things that, like you know, which we do agree with. Uh, brother, brother, uh, Bird's ne Bird Nest has made a, a comment here. Uh, uh, Kairi Mubarak to all, to all. May Allah bring the tranquility and wisdom upon the truth uh, guardians. I mean, I mean, brother. Yeah. So um, uh, Eid Mubarak. I think we may may meant to say Eid Mubarak. Anyway. So carry on. Yeah. So yeah. As I was saying, sorry. As I was saying that, like you know, um, uh, Imam Ibn Hazm. Today we will find a lot of these uh, uh, the books that um, uh, I think I've got the uh, Kam Al Al Kam somewhere or I don't know. Um, 
I have a book which is uh, similar, yeah, which is in the field of uh, Sula and Sip. Anyway, carry on. For example, Ikham al Akam in the field of Usul al Fiqh, al Fisal in theology, and al Muhalla in Fiqh. Due to Ibn Hazm's tireless efforts, the Madhab took hold in Islamic, star, Islamic Spain, where it flourished, and from there it sped to some areas of North Africa and elsewhere. It remained prevalent in Spain until the Islamic State began to crumble there in the early 1400s. With the disappearance of the Muslim state of Andalus, and the Madhab also disappeared, leaving behind only a number of scholarly writings, most of which were done by Ibn Hazm himself. Okay. All right. So we'll finish on this today. We'll mm -hmm. end here. And then next week we will start, inshallah, on the Jariri Madhab. Now, as you've seen, oh, now we've, we've, we've done some Madhab which were prominent and we've done some Madhab which, um, uh, you know, we've never heard of. Maybe people who've never studied the, uh, about Madhabs. And this is the whole point of doing this, this uh, session because now you get acquainted with, like, you know, uh, what is the fiqh and, and who said what and whatever and who were these imams. Because sometimes you might be listening to an imam or reading a book and you see Imam uh, Al Ozai said this. Uh, you think who, who is Imam Al, Al Ozai or who, who is Imam, uh, you know, uh, Ahmed bin Hanbal or whatever? Whereas now, when you're getting acquainted uh, with them, you know who they were and you know what, what they wrote and you know what they taught and everything. So, next week, inshallah, we'll be starting with we'll be starting on page um, 97 and we'll be going through the, the uh, Jariri, Jariri Madhab. Um, if any, if any questions there, if you can, um, uh, uh, Brother Muhammad, um, uh, Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and uh, well, welcome. Well, we're finishing now, so um, uh, but um, maybe you were listening before and uh, you were busy with work. So anyway, um, uh, you can you can go back to you can go back to it as well. But Muhammad, alhamdulillah, he's um, uh, he joined me on my show on Thursday as well, and he's a sheikh as well. So uh, so don't be uh, don't be fooled, yeah. He's a I very mean... good sheikh as well. And alhamdulillah, I'd just like to um, uh, uh, give a shout out to his uh, sponsor, which is called Bear Beard, like you know Bear Beard, you know. So they 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 okay. make uh, they make they make products for the man's beard, and uh, right. you know. So if um, I think he's got them um, uh, some. Links or whatever that he'd sent so the you know they 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 they're based in the UK and um, I mean, shout out and yeah and brother Muhammad you can you can you can you can send the check in the post um, uh, when I finish yeah? <laughs> for, for all the flagging and everything anyway so if anybody's if any if anybody's got a, any questions or whatever we'll go through that we'll just wait a little bit sister do you have any questions or um, anything you'd like to uh um, uh, there was one part I wanted to go up to. Uh, yeah. We were talking about in the um, in the Hambly Madhab okay. on the his sources mm -hmm. when he spoke about the Sunnah. So mm -hmm. they said his only stipulation was that it be marfu attributed directly okay. to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Right. So is that? Can you kind of go in on that and explain that a bit more? Let me let me let me, let me just check that now. Um, is it Imam uh, Ahmad bin Hanbal? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. page ninety-three. Let me see. Okay, uh, we're talking about the the, the, the ijma or uh, what, the what are sunnah? we talking about now? The sunnah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Likewise, the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ occupied the number of uh, number two position among the principal uh, among the fundamental principles used by the founder of this school in the deduction of the laws. His only stipulation that it be uh, marfu. And uh, that is attributed directly to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now, there's two types of hadith, yeah? There's a hadith where, like, you know, for example, a Sahaba was sat with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he heard it directly from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, okay? And there is another one where a Sahaba would say, like, you know, I heard from my father, or I heard mm. from Fulan Fulan, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said this, this, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said that. Now, the one that is marfu came directly from the mouth of, of that Sahaba. He was with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at the time when the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam narrated it. So Imam, mm -hmm. Ahmed, Imam Ahmed actually took the hadith, which, which came directly out of the mouth of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he kind of like, you know, disregarded, I wouldn't say he would totally disregard everything, but he, he would give priority to the marfu hadith, which uh, came directly from uh, from from the mouth of, of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Okay, That's all it. right. Yeah, because because like I said, there, there there's two situations. They could have been sat in in a gathering with the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and once a Sahaba asked him a question. 
Uh, so Prophet Sallallahu directly answered that uh, to him. So he got, this is marfu, marfu, yeah. Now, another sahaba could have been a child or he could have been younger or whatever. Like, for example, we say Ibn Umar. Ibn Umar was a child at the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he was growing up as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was, um, uh, was, was uh, you know, through, through his life. Now, there are some things that were narrated to him from other sahabas that, that, were, that were with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He could have been a child at that time. His father narrated it to him. It is still a hadith. It's not uh, weak or whatever, but he didn't hear it directly from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay. You, uh, you get my point? I do, yeah. I do, I right. do. Right, okay. I do. So, so Imam, Imam Ahmed, he gave priority in, in his um, deduction of laws only that the hadith is marfu, directly from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Okay, okay, thank right. you, brother. Jazakallah, care, right. I understand. You're welcome. Right, okay. So, brother Muhammad, yeah, um, uh, yeah, you are. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm chocolate milkshake, so you're probably vanilla milkshake, yeah. So, anyway, so, uh, <laughs> yeah, anyway, so, oh, you're, you're on the treadmill. Yeah. Anyway, brothers, some uh, brothers and sisters, Jazakallah khair for for attending, and uh, I hope you've been you've benefited from this. Uh, I surely have as well because by reading this and everything, I studied this about eight, ten years ago. You see, so a lot of things are coming back, uh, and a lot of the things that I'm telling you are actually coming from my mind itself, what I studied. So I mean, I'm bringing all this back again. You see, so Alhamdulillah for me, it's a, it's 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 a, it's, a, it's a process of of re bringing you know bringing back what the what I studied before, and for you as well, it's a, it's a, it's a process of of learning so please make God that Allah gives me more knowledge and uh, whatever uh, if there was anything wrong that I said came from me and if there's anything good that you benefited came direct uh, directly from uh, from Allah so I think we'll end here and um we will see you tomorrow inshallah tomorrow there is the aqida lesson and where we will be doing the book um uh which is the radiance of faith we will be doing that and these books now are coming to a certain point where we'll be ending them maybe in a month or two because we've reached mm -hmm. more than this book now we've reached more we're going towards the quarter of this book now mm -hmm. so uh, like you know we'll be finishing so we'll end here and um jazakallah khair and uh, may allah bless you all and inshallah remember Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum salam everyone.